I am the great traitor. There must be no other. Anyone who even thinks about deserting this mission will be cut up into 98 pieces. Those pieces will be stamped on until what is left can be used only to paint walls. Whoever takes one grain of corn or one drop of water more than his ration will be locked up for 155 years. If I, Aguirre, want the birds to drop dead from the trees, then the birds will drop dead from the trees. Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Dan. Welcome back to 15 Minute Film Fanatics. You know how this podcast works. Today we're doing a wonderful movie, but very but very strange. It's Werner Herzog's A Gear, The Wrath of God, starring Klaus Kinski from 1972. Uh, this is a quite a famous film, especially outside of the United States. This is considered like one of the greatest art house films of all time. Uh, Dan, you just watched it all the way through. What did you think? We did Fitzcarraldo, and this movie makes Fitzcarraldo look like look like Top Gun Maverick. It makes Fitzcarraldo look like a summer big budget blockbuster. This is this is a great movie, and I have, I have a lot to say about it. It's strange and compelling, and I was it, it's only ninety minutes, but it feels so much longer. And I don't mean that as an insult. I, I think that's a great magic trick. So I was trying to think of other movies we've done, right? And what I settled on is. You think about the experience of watching this to the experience of watching Goodfellas. Like, let's think about that for a second, right? Goodfellas is two and a half hours. It feels like it's 10 minutes. You put It feels like it's over in 10 minutes, right? Goodfellas is all forward momentum. This is a slow burn. And then I kept thinking in the car, red lights. I'm like, well, you know, in Goodfellas, you're kind of sucked into the protagonist's mind. Like you follow Henry along. And here you kind of look on as like a detached observer. Like you don't go into his mind at all. Thank God, right? And and I, I love how the movie looks almost like it predicts all that found footage stuff, like the Blair Witch Project. It looks like found footage of the Conquistadors. And of course, Goodfellas is the most polished movie in the world. You know, you get sucked into the restaurant scene and all that stuff. I think it's the direct opposite of, of the movie experience you expect, because there's so many times where you're like, what's going on here? But you can't look away. Like that opening scene where they're walking down the mountain, like it, it that could go, it, it feels like it goes on forever because you can't get over this feeling of like you are there and you could read all the books you want about, about Peru and about, you know, the Andes and the, the conquistadors, but it's like Herzog said, listen, you can read all those books. I'm going to fill in your imagination. I'm going to imagine this stuff for you. And you're going to watch this movie and you're going to get a sense of what it was like. And I don't want to, I, I, I don't, this movie wasn't made yet, but there's obviously something standing in the background, which is a famous Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Which is what? I expected Conan the Barbarian. Oh. I, I expected <laughs> Klaus Kinski, uh, you know, fights a thousand natives. And that's the end of the movie uh, you, ba- based on the name. But then yes. you find out that he is um, once Werner Herzog called his friend Klaus Linsky, a great pestilence, which is what a gear is. He is a great pestilence yeah. uh, on his people, on the rest of the people that he's traveling with uh, on the land. And I, I it's I, had, I hadn't thought of it until you just said Goodfellas, but it's inconceivable to think of this movie as narrated by a gear the same way that Goodfellas is narrated by Henry Hill, because yeah. you wouldn't. That's actually what that's what the ending is. Right. But you're you're very grateful that it only goes on for five minutes. Yeah, because at the end, he's and we'll get to this when we do the ending. Of course, he's limping around. And of course, what who's who's our favorite famous villain who walks with a limp? Richard the third. Richard the third. Right. 
but he's not, it's not like watching Richard the third where Richard kind of invites you in and he says, watch what I'm going to do. And then he goes and does like, you're like part of the fun of Richard the third is you're kind of in on the act. You, you are nowhere near the act here when he starts talking, you know, and, and saying his stuff, like, you know, uh, you know, anyone who thinks about deserting this mission will be cut up into 198 pieces. You're just watching this going like, where did he get the number 198? Like, it's so great how you watch it and, and you're so jarred and, and, and go back to think about, the, you know, how it shows the jungle, you know, this is not the love affair to the Amazon the way that like the Lord of the Rings is Peter Jackson's love affair to New England. I mean, this is like nature is red in tooth and claw. When you see that mouse like running away with its babies and all the monkeys and stuff we'll talk about, how about when the cannon gets stuck in the beginning in the mud and, and you're like, they're not like getting out. And you see the the princess in the, or the, you know, in the sedan chair and you're like, uh, yeah, that doesn't fit. Like the river's always going to win, right? The river's always going to win. The jungle's always going to win. And a gear thinks, no, I'm going to win. I'm the wrath of God. And then as the movie goes on, you're like, nah, you're not going to win. It's ridiculous. I, I like that he builds the sun hutch on the top of the, yeah. uh, on the top of the raft, but it's hit by a low lying limb which just shaves it off. I love how also you said about Conan the Barbarian because other movies I kept thinking of as I watched this was, I thought this is, and these are obviously not in chronologically possible, but this movie is part deliverance. I right? think about that, how much like deliverance. It's obviously part of Apocalypse Now. It's got Fitzcarraldo stuff in it. I mean, I know it precedes all these things. And Southern Comfort. You ever see the movie Southern Comfort? No. With Paris Booth and... and, and uh, Keith Carradine are, are National Guard guys that get caught in the bayou and they get hunted down, right? And of course, it reminds me of one of our favorite movies, which is, it reminds me very much of There Will Be Blood. Yeah, and w I think what I like about this, the same way that I like There there Will Be Blood, is that this is not a realistic movie. I, the, the, I, I agree with you that some of it looks like documentary found footage, uh, but it obviously drives into what I could only call dream sequence, but without the signaling of dream sequence. Right. Um, I, have, I have a friend who, who reads Faulkner and can't stand that some of the words in Faulkner are italicized be because you slip into somebody else's mind. And that's exactly what a gear is like. It starts out in a sense of reality, which is mediated by several minds, but it ends up only in one. Yeah, but it's almost impossible to tell where the transition takes place, and that's what I found really moving about it. Yeah, because it starts out. It's it, it, when the movie begins. The first twenty minutes are about how hard it is to get all this crap down the oh, mountain, down the mountain, everything like that. And then before you know it, you're like, "Oh, look, there's a boat in a tree." <laughs> and, then, and then people are saying that arrow does not hurt me. That arrow is not real. And you're like, what did I miss something? But it's, it's a wonderful feeling because like the joke is, yeah, you did miss something because you, you've, you've been in this environment too long. Welcome back. In part two, we talk about our favorite moments. Mike, go. My favorite moment in the movie was when uh, the emperor of El Dorado dropped dead next to the latrine that latrine by the way i think it's originally intended to gross you out and then i realized uh that is probably pretty sanitary but it's wonderful how pompous this guy is he actually holds the the center of the movie together it it almost feels like he's going to be a minor character like it's a minor decision but it it ends up having major ramifications um how much he hates the horse the yep. the entire middle segment of this is literally the emperor uh, wears no clothes and right the the emperor has no bathroom which is that he he keeps eating uh the entire expedition's food yep. and obviously has the river is taking its toll the sun is taking its toll uh on on his body um but he really falls into the grandeur of thinking of himself as the emperor right away um you know bonus moment if i can steal one sure. is when uh the they they sentence um they sentence the guy to death. Yeah, for sure. and his at his first act as emperor is is to grant clemency. It's so good. It's so good. He reminds me so much of uh, the 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 sheriff in Robin Hood in Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. Just this bumbling, and that's why Aguirre makes him the emperor. Like Aguirre, he's like, I'm going to make you the emperor, and then I'll I'll be the man behind the man, so to speak. But those see, you're right about the sun getting to him and everything like that, and actually starting to believe. Remember, he's like, what about my throne? He's like, what is a throne but a plank, my lord? To actually believe it that you're actually doing this thing on the river, and that's actually going to work. Well, because the the first. In, again, in that trial scene, the first thing you hear him say as emperor is approach the witness stand, which is that one stick. 
<laughs> it's like Lord but of the Flies. It, it is. And it it's like Lord of the Flies in the sense that the parody of civilization makes you realize that it's not a parody, right? The, the big wooden bench at your local courthouse has a symbolic meaning, but it's exactly the same as the stick. And so they try to imbue regular objects with the same symbolic meaning, um, which is both pathetic, uh, but then contemplative. That's great. And what was your moment? So my moment is his monologue, which I couldn't get over, but he starts saying, I am the great trader. There must be no other. And he says the whole thing about 198 pieces. That's just, that is just great. And I don't speak German, but I was still so stirred by his, his pronunciation and the way he spoke. And I want to talk about a specific line. He says, you know, if you take one grain of corn or, or rice more than, or I'm sorry, corn or one drop of water, you're going to be locked up for 155 years. And it's this line. He says, if I, a gear, want the birds to drop dead from the trees, then the birds will drop dead from the trees. And he says, I am the wrath of God. So not only is that, that is so striking. Why? Because it, first of all, it just sounds great. It hits your ear when you say it out great. If I want the birds to drop dead from the trees, then the birds will drop dead from the trees. It's, it scans in English. It's poetic. It reminds me of our favorite line from the last detail. I am the shore patrol, right? It's, you know, asserting power. But I thought to myself, well, why would you want that? Why, why would that be your command as the wrath of God to make all the birds just all of a sudden at once drop dead from the trees? Why would you want to do that? And I think it's, you know, it's, that's how he imagines what power is. You said before he's a pestilence, right? Power is bringing death. It's the opposite of what Portia tries to show in The Merchant of Venice, which is like in Portia in the famous scene in The Merchant of Venice, the trial scene, another trial, right? She says, no, you show your power by not using it. Right. The quality of mercy is not strange. She says, you know, it becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. But Aguirre, he doesn't care about the Merchant of Venice. He doesn't care about Portia. It's that I am the wrath of God. And to show your power, people have to die. Hence the scene where the guy counts to 10. And he says, I think he's a head taller. That may change. And he, he says 10 after his head gets cut off. Like, that's how you show. That's how you do God's work is by making the birds die and anyone else that you think deserves it. And what's Interesting to me is that when you're reading The Merchant of Venice or watching The Merchant of Venice, there's so many beautiful lines uh, that Portia's monologue is really a, a, a capstone, right? That's a famous soliloquy in right. a play that has many famous soliloquies. In a gear, that's not the case. Right. There's nothing that precipitates that kind of beauty. It just flashes out of nowhere. And the sense in which he can make the birds drop dead from the trees it's kind of like the way O'Brien tells Winston that he could float around the room like a soap bubble if he wanted to and land on his feet, which is that as the universe has shrunk into the mind of one person, anything is possible. Right. Because, because you know, and O'Brien, O'Brien knows it. He's He's got it. He's shrunk in the universe that, that much down. Now, of course, Aguirre's universe gets shrunken down to the raft. And we'll talk about that ending when we get to segment three. Welcome back. In part three, we always talk about the ending. Well, if there was a movie we've done recently, Mike, where we, we can have a field day with the ending, it's this one. So what do you think? When I was watching the ending, something struck me, and this may be just reading personal experience too, too much into it, but I have to say this is almost exactly like what a startup is like. You're just, it's a very small group of people. You're focused on one task. You you switch leaders you pivot, you change the name, you slowly, everybody starts to die one by one. And it, I just couldn't help but read how contemporary the structure of that is because, but because a lot of people have that in their mind, that's now a trope for movies and television too. And it, and it struck me that this was some, it, if you're Werner Herzog, right, it, it's actually about making movies. That's the the whole right. point is everything that he does is actually about making movies, right? So it's about this troop of people d down in who go to the jungle who try right, to, to try story. to conquer the river, but the right. con conquering the river to to make the birds fall from the trees is to get the ship up there so that you can film it, right? right. Whether it's drawn in or whether it's a prop or whatever they did. Yeah. They did something. Making a movie is also to go into a different movie. Making a movie is like trying to drag a ship across the land. To, right to and, the other river but it it's also in that way 
you know, at this particular moment in, in history, it's impossible for me to escape how much it reminded me of building and being in startups in the middle of the jungle trapped. <laughs> and just drifting around in a circle, you know, talking to yourself about your big plans. And my other favorite moment that I forgot to say is I really love when they um, when they find the village and they find all the bananas. Yeah. And and all they can think about is dragging away the pigs and bananas, because I, I think um, that in a Hollywood movie about the same thing, that this would be all about, um, you know, death and glory and people forget about gold really fast. But as soon as they see those bananas, the bananas are El Dorado. And I, I think that the. This this movie knows exactly what it wants to be, and I can't believe that it's ninety minutes. Do you know how long it took to make? No. Do you know how much it took to make? No, I don't. Tell me. Three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. That's how long it. did it take to make? Do In, you know that? Uh, a couple of weeks. I think that 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 they did in a couple of weeks. Hold on, let's check. Exactly five weeks, which is how much time the actual crew is supposed to be on the raft. Right. It starts on January first, and he's dead by the first week of February. Uh, I, and I don't I don't think it was shot, you know, month for month, but it was shot in exactly the span of time that they're supposed to be down there. Yeah. A friend of mine told me that Herzog once visited Kubrick on the set of The Shining and was like flabbergasted because Kubrick, of course, makes movies in the exact opposite way as Herzog. Right? Every single you know dust particle is figured out beforehand. You know, it takes whatever, two days to film the camera pulling into the the, the, the picture of Jack Nicholson at the end. And Herzog like, couldn't believe it. He's like, this is how you make a movie. And Kubrick was like, yeah, this is how you make a movie. It's like totally opposite styles. Um what you said about these guys going up the river, my take on the ending is, is I love what you said about you're just all alone, just drifting around. And, and you keep hoping, like you said, when you run a startup, well, where is success? Where is this thing going to become successful? It's it's up further. It's up further, right? And every time they ask, they ask the, the guys, like, where is El Dorado? When they rip the gold off the guy's neck, he's, where is it? He goes, it's up further. It's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just up a little further. And that's like chasing success, right? If you're a startup, it, it's, we're just going to get on the river a little more. Yeah, I'll throw these monkeys overboard, but we're going to make it. The ending of this movie reminded me very much of what Melville in Moby Dick via Ishmael calls the truest book ever written. Do you know what this is? He says in Moby Dick, this is the truest book ever written. That book is Ecclesiastes because he says all is vanity, right? All. And that's what I kept thinking of as I watched again. I'm like, man, all is vanity. He He's on that raft with those monkeys that just come out of nowhere, right? And I love how they just keep going larger and larger. He picks the one up and throws it overboard. And, and he's still, no, nope, this is it. This is it. I'm going to go. We're going we're gonna to do, we're going to one-up Cortez. And that earlier in the film, remember the guy Balthazar, who was a prince, says, I feel sorry for you. I said, why? Because he knows there's no escape from the jungle. And that's, of course, metaphorically true, too. There's no escape. It's like, and that's why I thought of There Will Be Blood. So at the end, there's no Clarence the Angel to come down and tell Daniel Day-Lewis what he's done wrong. He says, you know, I am the, 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 the book of the fourth revelation. And, and then it, it's, it's over and it ends the exact same way of this person you just watch in horror and you realize, I think the monkeys is a great touch. I mean, that's his court. That's he, he's now in charge of in, in charge of New Spain, but it's a bunch of monkeys that they just keep running over his feet. And there's a lot of interesting it, I, this seems like an unlikely art house film, although I will say that liking other art house films, there are some beautiful moments and images that stick out in my mind. Like, for example, when she just leaves the party yeah, and walks, when she walks, walks into, into the, into the yeah. woods and disappears. Right. Because, of course, in a Hollywood movie, you'd, you'd find her body three days later. Right. right. But she just disappears. And there's no reason why that should be. There's no reason for that moment to exist. It's just a, a wonderful piece of inspiration that lends its breath to the to the experience of the rest of the film. It makes it it makes it more striking than in the, if they don't find her because you wait for five minutes you're like okay they're going to find her and they don't and all those un Hollywood things that like for example how everybody dies in this movie you just turn around and there's a spear in you like you don't you don't see the guys from the side of the river you just or, or when he gets up the next morning and the, remember when the guys are on the other side of the river and they're trapped on the raft and they look down and they're all dead. And they're just, they're just there. And they're like, well, who killed? Well, we don't know. We're going to find the guys that killed them. And no, the, the spears come out of nowhere. They don't make any noise. So when his daughter gets killed, all of a sudden he just turns around. And there's a spear in her. And you're like, that, that strikes me. That's very, very intense. I like how they're trapped with the pipe player, but he only knows the one song. <laughs> Play the music. Right? Thanks for listening, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our conversation about a year, the wrath of God. 
Keep the requests coming. Follow us on Twitter at 15 and Film. You could also follow us on Letterboxd. And also let us know what you want to see next. We take reviews. We love reviews. Please leave us some reviews on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We're still having a blast with this. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time.